Well, good morning and welcome to Grace again. My name is Patrick Williams. I'm our executive pastor here at the church, and I am just thrilled that you're here with us this morning. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, in the seat back in front of you is a connection card. If you could take that out and fill it out for us throughout the message today, we would really appreciate it. On the back of that is actually what I want to draw your attention to. It says prayer requests. We take prayer here at Grace really seriously. And so if there's anything that we can be praying for you or for a loved one for, you can list that on that prayer card. Uh, and then when the offering basket comes by later on in our service, you can place the card into the basket and you can know that we will be praying for you or your loved ones throughout this week. So we're nearing the end of our retold series. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I have, I have really enjoyed this. I've enjoyed being able to take a look at these, these timeless heroes, these, these scriptural heroes uh, of our faith, and really seeing and hearing a bit more from each of our pastors on them, uh, and really being challenged by them. And so we're going to be wrapping this up next week, but today we get to look at the life of Joshua. And Joshua is one of my favorite characters from the Bible, and so I'm really, really excited to be able to share with you. But before we do that, why don't you join me in a word of prayer as we pray for our service. Father, I thank you for this opportunity that I have to share some of your story with grace. Lord, I pray that you would be at work in each of our hearts. Help us to let go of any distractions or any other things that are going on in our lives and to just hear the message that you need each of us to hear. I thank you that your word is alive and powerful, and I pray that your word would speak into our lives this morning. Amen. I was about to start as the first director of student ministries for Cross of Christ Church in 2009. I'd served at Faith Lutheran for eight years as their middle school ministers, minister, and I was beyond excited for this new opportunity. See, I love to build things in ministry. I love to find better ways for us to more effectively reach lost people. And so I was so excited for this opportunity. And before I started, I had a quiet time with God, and I remember this prayer that I prayed. I said, Dear God, Teach me new things through this opportunity. And at the time, I thought that was a great prayer. I wanted to learn new things. I was so excited for the new challenges that God was going to give me over the next several years of my life. And that was part of why I had taken that job. Let me report to you what happened. I did, in fact, face a lot of new challenges. However, exciting is not the word I would use to describe any of those challenges. In fact, what I went through for the next three years we're probably, it'd probably be better summarized as taxing, as hard, as gut-wrenching, as keep you up in the middle of the night sweating bullets, dreading the next day that you have to go to work type of challenges. And so that prayer, God, teach me new things through this opportunity, it, it really did come true. I learned more than I ever could have imagined. But all of the stuff that I learned came through hardship, came through pain, came through suffering. I learned how to endure I learned how to deal with conflict. I le learned how to deal with really bad and poor financial management in a church. I learned how to walk alongside, which is just a really friendly way of saying deal with really difficult people. I learned how to deal with a boss that was untrustworthy and, quite honestly, was dishonest all the time. So yeah, God taught me new things. But believe me, if I ever pray that prayer again, it's going to go something like this. God, teach me new things, but may it all be through really positive, good circumstances in my life and not pain, hardship, or suffering because I don't want any more of that. So here, here's the point. As I was going through that time, as I was relentlessly just going through these trials over and over, I really did learn some important things. One of the things that I learned was that I needed to be way more specific in my prayer. Now, when I'm not specific, God just does whatever he wants, and sometimes that isn't what I want. And God is God, so we just let him do what he wants anyways. But I learned that I should be a little bit more specific. The second thing I learned was that I needed to be true to God through all of those things, through everything that was going on. It, it was this constant lesson in just how to have integrity especially around people that didn't. I, I needed to learn more of that. Every night I would lay down my head on my pillow and I would just pray to God that I had done everything I could to honor him and to live my life for him. The third thing I learned was that I needed to figure out what success was going to look like in this season of ministry. Because the people that I was working for, they had a very different version of success than what God had. And so I learned that I needed to figure out what God's point of view on success was, what he would deem successful. And I wanted to live my life for that, not the praise of others. 
So as I was reading through the story of Joshua in preparation for today, there was a section of scripture that just, it, it lit up, it stuck out, it's so, so awesome. And, and I wanted to talk with you about it because it is all about success. But it's not about success from people's point of view. It's about success from God's point of view, about what it would look like for us to be successful in his eyes. And so before we even go any farther, I do just want to, I want to clarify, I'm going to use the word success a lot, and it can make some people a little uncomfortable because we might think that I'm talking about a personal success, like let's make Pat more rich. I would love that, but that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about today is how we could be successful in God's eyes, how we could be successful like Joshua, as we're going to see, was successful. Because his life was not defined by the land that he conquered, but instead by following God's will for his life. So with that, let's jump into the story of Joshua. So we're catching up with the Israelite nation after they've been wandering in the desert for 40 years. And so there's one thing we've learned thus far about the nation of Israel, is that they do not do a good job at listening to God. In fact, because they wouldn't listen to God and because they wouldn't listen to Moses, they do spend 40 years wandering around the desert. But we're catching up with them as a new generation has risen up. And they're ready to take over and to inherit the promised land that was promised to their forefathers. And so the story of Joshua, it records Joshua's leadership of the people of God as they finish that march and conquer the promised land. And now most people, we might see Joshua's success as a leader by whether or not he actually did that. Did he conquer the land? We might see success by how many battles did he won. He won a lot. We might see success based on the amount of money that he got from the fights that he had. But that is not what God calls Joshua to in regards to success. God gives Joshua a very different definition of success. And that definition is what we're going to spend a lot of time looking at and talking about today because we want to learn how to be successful from God's point of view and not from man's. So the book of Joshua begins like this. It says, After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. And then God continues to speak to Joshua. And what he says next is this, this key text that we're going to keep looking at throughout today. Okay, this is the verses that talk about how Joshua can be successful from God's point of view. And so here's what God says to Joshua. He says, be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I'm a huge fan of trying to figure out what the one big thing is. And this text that I just read from Joshua chapter 1, this is God's one big thing to Joshua. God is saying to Joshua, do this and you will be successful. He's saying this to the people of Israel, do this and you'll get the promised land. This is Joshua's one big thing. Be strong and courageous. Obey God. Study his word. And then what we see throughout the entire rest of the book of Joshua is his attempt to live out this key section of scripture. So let's look at one of the stories from the book of Joshua. We're going to look at um, the battles in chapter 6 and 7. And does anybody know what Joshua chapter 6 is? It's the fall of Jericho. So we're going to look at these two battles in 6 and 7, and we're going to see how the nation of Israel did at actually living out this one big thing. So God gives Joshua some pretty clear instructions on how they can take over Jericho and destroy the city. And so they follow them. They march around the city for six days. And then on the seventh day, they march around it seven times. They shout, the walls from down, fall down, and then they destroy the city. And so what we see, if we read through the entire battle of Jericho, is we see God's word being adhered to and listened to by the people. We begin to see this new theme emerge, that when the nation of Israel is faithful to God, when they listen to and when they obey his instructions, God remains faithful to them by giving them these cities without much trouble. 
And so while God is doing this, while he's, he's giving them these instructions, when they go and they follow it, it ends with this. It says this warning. This is a beautiful warning from God to Joshua. He says, do not take any of the things set apart for destruction, or you yourselves will be completely destroyed, and you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. So that's the end of chapter 6. So we turn the page, and we're in chapter 7, and Joshua and the nation of Israel, they're getting ready to go to battle against the nation of Ai. And this is how it begins. But Israel violated the instructions about the things set apart for the Lord. A man named Achan had stolen some of these dedicated things, so the Lord was very angry with the Israelites. And Joshua doesn't know what's going on, so they, he sends them into attack. They attack the nation of Ai, and they get beaten really badly. They get beaten because they're not being faithful to God and to his word. So Joshua, he cries out to them, why did you do this? He cries out to God. He says, why did you do this? Why did you bring us to this point? only to allow us to be defeated. And God, he speaks back to Joshua. And basically what he says to him, this is the paraphrase, he says, the people didn't listen. Figure out what they did. Deal with this. Or you're going to be destroyed too. And so what do you think Joshua, a man who's trying to be successful from God's point of view, does? He obeys God. He brings the nation of Israel forward. He figures out that Achan had done this and he takes care of things just as God told them to. And after they've dealt with that problem, God speaks to Joshua and he says, don't be afraid or discouraged. Take all your fighting men and attack Ai. For I've given you the king of Ai, his people, his town, and his land. You'll destroy them as you destroyed Jericho and its king. And so the nation of Israel, they go and attack Ai. And they don't have any trouble. They take over the city pretty quickly. So in the battle of Jericho, what we see is we see the people listening to God. And we see how God allows them to defeat the towns without any trouble. But then in the battle of Ai, we see Israel's failure to listen to God. We see their failure to obey God. And they lose that first battle. And so God, he's making it abundantly clear that for them, that for the nation of Israel to inherit this promised land, that they need to be obedient to him and to his word. So this one little moment of Joshua's life, it shows us how he's trying to be successful, how he's trying to listen to these instructions that God gave to him in the first chapter. And if we'd continue to read through the rest of the book of Joshua, we'd see more battles. We'd see the land being divided out to all the different nations, all the different tribes of Israel. And eventually we'd get to the very end. Joshua is now an old man. He's, he's nearing the end of his life. And he's speaking to the entire nation. And this is what he says. So be very careful to follow everything Moses wrote in the book of instruction. Sound a little familiar? Do not deviate from it, turning either to the right or to the left. Make sure you do not associate with the other people still remaining in the land. Do not even mention the names of their gods, much less swear by them or serve them or worship them. Rather, cling tightly to the Lord your God as you have done until now. Remember chapter 1? Remember that key text? God said that to Joshua. And here we are. We're at the end of Joshua's life. He's lived this out. He's strived to live this out. He's tried to get the people to live this out. And here he is sharing this exact same thing with the nation of Israel. Follow God's word. Don't turn from it. Don't worry or worship any other gods. Don't worry about anything else. Let me take care of you. Cling tightly to me. And so that little look into the life of Joshua we see just this wonderful story about a man who's trying to live out a faithful life to God, who's trying so hard to remind and to instruct the people how to be faithful to God. It's this story about success, but not success like we would define it, success by how God defines it, how he could be successful based on what God says to him. So I want to reread to you that section of scripture, that one big thing text. This is Joshua chapter 1. It says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. In my life, I have become reliant on trying to live out this text, because the truth is I, I, I want to be successful, but I don't want to be successful from man's point of view. I want to be successful by God's point of view, because we, the world, we define success in some pretty crazy ways. 
For some of us, we might say that we're successful if we make this much money or if we have this big of a house, we have this many cars. For some of us, we might view success as how many followers we have on Instagram or how many friends we have on Facebook. We might see success as maybe even a bit of a status symbol or like a popularity contest by how popular we are. Then we're successful. But what God says to Joshua is so different from that. What God teaches Joshua about success is not any of those things. And what he teaches Joshua is what I want to be successful as. It's how I want to live my life. And so here's what God says to Joshua. To be successful, you need to do three things. Here are those three things. First one, be strong and courageous because the task ahead will not be easy. If we look into the life of Joshua, we see that he's tasked with clearing out all of the Canaanites, that he's, he's supposed to take over a nation and return it back to his nation. Joshua, he's, he's tasked with leading a people to follow God. When they just spent 40 years in the desert because they couldn't follow God, the task ahead is not going to be easy. But for Joshua to be successful, he needs to be strong and courageous. He needed to listen to and to trust God with all that was in him. Yeah, this, is, this has been true time and time again in my own life. When life throws you a few rough days or maybe even a few rough months or let's face it, maybe a few rough years, we need to be strong and courageous. When I got to Cross of Christ, I quickly realized what I had gotten myself into and I knew pretty quickly the task ahead was not going to be easy, but I needed to be strong and courageous. I needed to trust God and to lean into him to guide me through those times. If we want to be successful from God's point of view, we need to be strong and courageous for the task ahead. It's not going to be easy. We all know we live in a broken world. We live in a world that views success as something vastly different than what God says success is. We live in a world where people will lie, they'll cheat, they'll steal just to get ahead. We live in a world where people will do unethical and immoral things just to make a few extra dollars. We live in a political climate that is in constant upheaval and turmoil. And when we turn on the news, when we're not seeing something more about our political mess, what we see is more hurt, more despair, more brokenness than we could ever imagine. Friends, the task ahead is not going to be easy. But for us to be successful in God's eyes, for us to be characterized as faithful, just like Joshua is, we need to be strong and courageous. We need to stay true to God and to be faithful to his calling on our lives. Isaiah 117 is one of my absolute favorite Bible verses, and it's so applicable to us. We need to learn to do good, seek justice, help the oppressed, defend the cause of orphans, fight for the rights of widows. Friends, we need to realize that missionaries are not just those that go overseas and serve impoverished nations, but that we are missionaries right here in the Damat area. We are missionaries in our homes, with our family, with our friends, with our neighbors. We need to bring the love of Christ to people that need it more than ever. The task ahead will not be easy, but be strong and courageous. And I love how God finishes off that section of Scripture because he says this to Joshua and he's saying this to us. Be strong and courageous for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Second thing that Joshua needs to do to be successful from God's point of view is to obey God's law. We, we looked into the story of Joshua. We saw a little bit about that story and what happens when they, the nation of Israel, do not obey God's law. Things do not typically go well for them. And I think a lot of people, when we hear the word God's law, we, we immediately cringe. We, whoa, whoa, you said law. And we have this misconception about God's law because we think that God's law is about restricting us, that it's about removing our freedoms or not allowing us to have as much fun as we want. But that's not at all true because God's law is not there to stop us from having fun. God's law is there to protect us. It's there to keep us safe, primarily from ourselves, from our own sinful desires and behaviors. And if we look at the, the nation of Israel, if we look at their story, God's not giving them this law to stop them from doing something. Instead, he's giving this law, them this law to protect them, to keep their relationship with him focused on him and nothing else. He knows how easy it is for people to be strayed, and so he says to the nation of Israel time and time again, this is my law. Obey this. It's for your own good. 
So in your own life, how are you doing at obeying God's law? I mean, really, are you trying to obey what the Bible says? Are you trying not to judge others? Are you trying to forgive others just as Christ forgave you? I'm not perfect. I'm far from it. I'm never going to be perfect. But when I see something like this, when I see something like the Ten Ten Commandments, when I see God's law, I see myself in it. I see my sin. I see my shortcomings. I see where I fall. And, man, I want to repent. I want to get forgiveness for those things when I see them. I want to grow from that stuff. So what about you? How are you doing at obeying God's law in your life? I want to make it a point, though, to kind of say this, that the second step in being successful from God's point of view, obeying God's law, it is so closely tied to our third one. And our third one is this, to constantly read and study the book of instruction, God's word. In fact, when we read that text from Joshua chapter 1, it actually said that we're to meditate on it day and night. And it's when we do that, it's when we read God's word, when we study his word, that's how we see what God's law truly is. That's how we see the brokenness in ourselves. That's why they're, they're so closely tied together. So let's talk about that for a little bit. Well, how do we constantly read and study God's word? What does that have to say to us? So the author of Hebrews, they, they, he writes this verse, and it's, it's absolutely beautiful. It says, God's word is alive and powerful. I, I truly believe that to be true. I, I believe that if we want to succeed from God's point of view, that we need to be in his word regularly. God's word, first and foremost, it is our direct connection to our God. It is his words for us, spoken to us. It convicts us, it strengthens us, it encourages us. I know sometimes people wonder, well, why should I read the Bible? You know, isn't it enough that I come to church and I let someone else teach me about it? Or some of us might say, I don't even have enough time to keep my inbox clean, let alone have time to read God's word. Let's look at Joshua's life. Joshua, for most of his life, he's been the apprentice to Moses. And all of a sudden, he's thrust into the spotlight. He's now the leader of an entire nation. And he's tasked with helping them get their homeland back. He's about to enter into battles. And he's literally leading a mobile nation, living in tents as they move around. And yet God says to him, you need to be constantly in my word. You can't avoid it. You need to make time for it. This needs to be a priority for you, Joshua. And I'll be honest, the same is true for you and I. We need to make God's word a priority in our life. If we're going to obey God's law, if we actually want to obey God's law, then we need to be in his word, letting it instruct us, teach us, and guide us. I I pulled out a few different Bible verses that I wanted to share with you this morning on the importance of studying God's word. 2 Timothy 3.16 is our first one. It says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Psalm 119, it says, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. And my personal favorite, it's Romans 15, 4. It says, such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. And the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. God's word is alive. It's powerful. It's speaking. And if you need a few more reasons as to why you should read the Bible, I'm going to post on Facebook this week an image that says eight reasons to read the Bible. Print that image out. Stick it on your fridge. Read those eight reasons. Read the corresponding scriptures, and they will help give you a very clear reason why you need to be reading God's Word, why we need to study this book of instruction continually. But that's why we should. Let's talk about how. How do I read God's word? How do I do that with my family, with my kids, with my teenagers, with my spouse? So I was talking to Pastor Tim, our lead pastor, about this section of the message this week, and he jokingly said to me, he said, in today's world, it's easier than ever to learn how to read God's word. Just Google it. And I laughed with him, and then I did it, because I wanted to, you know, see what that said. So I Googled how to read God's word, and do you know if you do this, this is what you're going to find. 
you're going to find 13,900,000 different pages about how to read God's Word. That's a lot. <laughs> it's a little bit daunting. And like most things on the internet, I guarantee you the vast majority is garbage. So what I've done for you to make it a tiny bit easier is on the back of your outline, I've given out some resources that I think are really good. You know, Oprah's got her book club. I give these my gold star stamp of approval. These are good resources that I use, that our staff uses, that I use with my kids and my family. There's a bunch right here. You are more than welcome to take a look at these, to flip through them. Um, but these resources will help you study God's Word. But I do want to point out one. One of them I want to draw your attention to and take a few moments to talk about. If you have a smartphone, you need to install the Bible app made by YouVersion. If you have children, you need to install the Bible app for kids made by YouVersion. It is the absolute best grocery shopping app ever to give your child because they're reading the Bible while they're probably annoying you about buying them more things. So give them that. But for you, the Bible app by YouVersion, you can't miss out on that resource. Not only does it have the Bible and a bunch of different translations in it, it has daily devotionals that you can sign up for. It has accountability tools built into the app. It has reading plans to read the Bible daily or monthly or weekly to get through the Bible in a year. Whatever you need, it's in there, and it is good. It is such a good resource to help us be in God's Word regularly. Let's go back to Joshua chapter 1. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you'll be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Friends, this challenge is for you today. Be strong and courageous, for the task ahead is not going to be easy. Obey God's law. Study God's word. One of the things that I love to always ask is, what's my next step? And so for you this morning, based on what we read, based on the story from Joshua, based on what success looks like from God's point of view, what is your next step? What is one thing that you could do to move forward in your faith in some way? Do you need to make it a priority just to study God's Word regularly? Maybe you need to purchase one of these resources and use them to help you in your studying of God's Word. Maybe for some of you, you just need to take Joshua 1, 6 through 9, write it out on a piece of paper and stick it somewhere so you see it every day. I recommend the horn of your car. Just don't read it while you're driving. But I guess if you're going to go, that is one way to go, reading God's Word while you, you know, you get the picture. <laughs> Maybe your next step is just simply open up God's Word to, to, to hear a bit more of His story. Maybe for some of you, you've got something in your life, something that you've been doing that you know God's saying you got to stop. And so maybe today is the day where you say, God, I'm done. I want to give that to you. I want to obey your law. Maybe, maybe for some of us, there's something that's holding us back. And it's time just to surrender that, to experience that freedom and the forgiveness that Christ is offering. If you're not a Christ follower, maybe it's time just to surrender some of your life over to him. I don't know what your next step is, but I want to challenge you to figure it out and to take it. I know for, for Melody and I, um, we've both made reading the Bible a, a priority in our lives. But for the most part, we've always done that kind of as our, on our own, in our own time and stuff like that. And so about seven or eight months ago, we were really convicted that we wanted to be doing that more together. And again, that Bible app, it's so great. We were able to set up each other as friends. And when you're set up as friends, you can invite someone to do a reading plan with you. And so every day now, we're doing reading plans together. And it holds us accountable. It shows us when the other person hasn't read. And so we can talk to each other. It even allows us to comment and to make questions or whatever else at the end of every section that each other can see and interact with. And so for the last seven or eight months, it has brought us closer together by just making that a priority to do with each other. But that was my next step. I want to share with you what my new next step is based on what we're talking about today, because I want to apply this to my life as well. And so my new next step 
is that I want to model more of this in front of my children. See, we, we do devotions and we pray together, but a lot of times when it comes time for our own personal devotion, Melody and I will do that later on at night after the kids are in bed because let's face it, you can and they're not there touching you, grabbing you, yelling at you, screaming at you, whatever else children do. Is that just mine? Okay, just checking. So now though, we're saying, you know what? We want to model this in front of them. We want them to see us wrestling with God's word, studying his word, growing from that, trying to figure out how we could better obey God's law. And so our new challenge is for us to do that in front of them. I don't, I don't know what your challenge is, but how can you grow closer to God? How can you apply some of this to your life? In the light of what we learned, in the light of what we've studied about Joshua, how could you be more successful from God's point of view? Where is it that you need to be strong and courageous? Can you do that? Where is it in your life that you need to do a better job at obeying God's law? Where is it in your own life that you need to study God's word more thoroughly? And how are you going to do that? What is your next step? And are you willing to take it? Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you that your word is alive and that it is speaking to us this morning. Lord, I pray that it has done just that. I pray that your word has challenged us. I pray that it sparked something inside of us that has helped to bring us closer to you. Lord, I pray for each person here, wherever they are at with you, that you are working, that you are strengthening, and that you are growing them in you. Whatever they have going on, help them to turn it over to you, to be strong and to be courageous, knowing that you are with them wherever you go.